Hello, my Berry Aftercare friends. Welcome to another episode of Berry Aftercare, the podcast. I'm excited. We are going back to basics today. I don't know if you are new to the world of bariatrics, if you are considering having weight loss surgery, if you are taking GLPs, if you are considering taking GLPs, I guess it's GLP-1s to be more specific, or if you're considering weight loss of any other kind. Weight loss requires weight loss maintenance, and that requires a whole lot of effort, no matter how one loses weight. So I'm going to go and do a review today, and maybe you are a new podcast listener, and if so, or if you're new to the world of bariatrics, this will be a great introduction for you. If you've been around for some time, it doesn't matter because this information is wonderful for us to review at any time. You know, they say it takes us a good seven times to hear things before they really sink in. And maybe you'll hear something today, even if this is kind of a review course for you. But maybe you'll hear something today that you finally go, hmm, I've heard that before. And maybe this is exactly what I needed to hear today to make it stick. And I'm going to start doing that. So what we're going to do today is a review of the bariatric basics. So welcome or welcome back. And let's go ahead and get started. As I said, today we're going to talk about bariatric basics. Bariatrics 101. So this information is really critical, not only for the weight loss portion of your adventure, but absolutely critical for maintaining weight loss. For people who have chosen to have weight loss surgery, or if you're getting ready to have weight loss surgery, too often I think, even though during pre-surgical evaluations, I hear information to the contrary, too often I think the truth is that people are thinking slash hoping that the surgery is going to take care of pretty much everything. It's the magic cure people have been looking for. I'm going to have this surgery and then not only will I lose the weight and keep the weight, but my life is going to be better and I am going to be happier than ever before. And that may be true for some people and that may be partially true for other people and it may not be true at all for still other people. What do I mean by that? Well, let me explain. Weight loss surgery or any other way a person chooses to lose weight is just that, a way to lose weight. Weight loss maintenance is a whole different ball game. I often liken the world of being a post-op, a post-op in terms of having had bariatric surgery to professional athletics. Why? Because if you do any research about professional athletics, they will tell you that the head part of the game of whatever sport they're involved in is 80% of success. 20% is about the physical performance. And I often think that that is true for people who lose weight as well, especially with bariatric medicine. But let's go back to the athletes for a minute. They say that even though 80% of the game is mental, only 20% of their time in practice is devoted to the mental and the emotional part of the game, while 80% of practice is dedicated to the physical part of practice, when only 20% of the game is about the athleticism, is about their performance. Now, I don't know if that's true, but I've read that before. And I think that for people who have had weight loss surgery, it can be very true that having surgery, the physical part, is the emphasis. The emphasis on let's get ready for surgery, and that is critical, and that is important. But the mental stuff is 20%. Post-operatively, many patients who are two, three, four years, anytime 
beyond the honeymoon stage are going to tell you that keeping the weight off is 80% about the emotional aspects of the weight loss adventure. 20% is about the physical part. Now, again, I don't think you can take those numbers to the bank, but the point is there's a lot of head stuff that goes along with weight loss and weight maintenance. And we are going to focus on that today, the bariatric basics. So I created what I call a gotta do list. And this was many, many years ago when I started in the world of bariatric medicine. I have since revised the list and you're going to get the new and updated revision in this review. There's both a physical gotta do list and an emotional gotta do list. And I just did not pull these things out of my head or any other place of my body just for grins and giggles. This information is very well researched. There's a lot of information out there about what people do to successfully lose weight and what people do to successfully keep that weight off. And that is what we are going to talk about in this edition, focusing on the bariatric basics. I'm going to start with the physical aspects. These are what I call the gotta do And I call them the gotta do because friends, if you want to keep your weight off, if you want to get that weight off and keep it off, and I mean keep it off for the rest of your life, which I know is your intention when you go into a diet or when you go into bariatric surgery, but it doesn't always happen partly because people aren't always prepared and partly because they don't have the skills or the know-how to follow through with these things. So I'm going to tell you what these things are that you got to do to get the weight off and keep it off. And if you don't have the skills or the ability or the know-how or the information or the education, then it is up to you to go get that. And you can get that in many places. And we'll talk about what those places are. One of those is through the Berry Aftercare program. All right. So the gotta do ums. Here we go. What do you got to do to lose weight? And what do you got to continue to do to keep that weight off? The first thing that you've got to do to keep this weight off is you've got to consistently make healthy food choices. I know there are people who have weight loss surgery who think, well, after the surgery and after I'm all healed up, I'll just eat whatever I want to. I'll eat less of it. That is not likely to keep the weight off because if you continue to eat an unhealthy diet, and I don't mean a diet like in a weight loss program, I mean a diet as in what you consume, what are the foods you intake on a regular basis. If your diet consists of largely junk food, processed food, high carb, high, um, the, the not so quality carb foods, high sugar content foods, it's going to be real tough for you to keep that weight off. So making consistently healthy food choices, meaning eat real food most of the time. This doesn't say anything about never having, having any junk food. It says make consistently healthy food choices. And as a bariatric patient, your bariatric dietitian, your bariatric surgeon, your bariatric friends are going to remind you that it's critical that you eat the protein first. There's a rhyme and a reason for this. And the reason is because if you put lean dense protein into your pouch first, you're going to fill up quickly. You're going to fill up You're going to stay filled up longer. You're going to feel full longer and you'll have less room in your pouch to put lesser quality foods. So when you learn about your macronutrients from your bariatric dietitian, pay attention and remember always the protein first, then the healthy vegetables, then the low sugar fruits. Did you hear me say that? Low sugar fruits. Yes, fruit is good for you. Yes, fruit is important in your diet. But there are some fruits 
that you should have only on occasion or you should eat in very small amounts because they're super high in sugar. And if you take in a lot of sugar, you're taking in a lot of empty calories. So you will ultimately gain weight. So the first got to do them behaviorally is to make consistently healthy food choices. Number two got to do them. Follow a low calorie meal plan because anybody who is going to maintain a healthy weight has to eat a calorie portion that is in line with your height, the weight you want to be, or a healthy weight for your body, which is not, you don't get to choose that because your body is going to choose the weight it's going to land on, but that's for another day. If you are an athlete and you are working out a lot, you're going to need more calories than somebody who has a much more sedentary lifestyle. If you are in your 50s or 60s, you're going to need fewer calories generally speaking, than somebody in their 20s and 30s. So you need to work with your bariatric dietitian to figure out what a good calorie count would be reasonable for you. And then you're going to have to modify that depending on how your body responds. The idea here when, when I say I got to do them is a low calorie meal plan is that You can't expect to be able to eat 5,000 calories and maintain weight loss. It's probably not likely to happen. Now, I am not a dietitian. So you do need to consult with a bariatric dietitian. And why do I keep saying bariatric dietitian? Because when you have bariatric surgery, friends, you are forever more a bariatric patient. And if you go to a dietitian who works in the general population, they are less likely to have the specified specific information and education that they need to have to consult with a bariatric patient because bariatric medicine is a very specialized field of medicine. So get the highest quality of care that you can. And if you've chosen to have bariatric surgery, find a bariatric dietitian who has experience in this field and find out from that person what a reasonable calorie count for you is and have them work with you on how many (coughs) grams of protein, (coughs) how many grams of high quality carbs, how many uh, grams of sugar are okay for you. I can't tell you that, but I can tell you You're going to need to maintain a fairly low calorie meal plan after you've had weight loss surgery. Number three, got to do them. Plan your meals and follow your plan. Now, there's a wide variety of ways that you can do this because you got to go with your personality here. Some of you may be big time planners, like I'm going to plan every meal. I'm going to write it out. I'm going to write out the grocery list. I'm going to get the groceries. I'm going to meal plan every week. And if that works for you, then by golly, do that. Do what works for you. If you are a person who is not going to cook, you're just not going to do it. You want convenience. You want easy. Then figure out what sources of protein that you like the most and make sure you have those on hand at work, at home. If you're going to be out and about at your kids' events, then you pack in a cooler the things that you're going to need while you're gone. So find the sources of protein that you like because we're always going to eat that protein first in planning our meals. Then have some vegetable options, have some low sugar fruit options available to you. If you do want to make a a meal, then you can prepare it ahead of time and maybe just take a slice of your egg casserole with you in your cooler. Or you can take a protein shake if you know you're going to be out and about for a long time and you need to have some protein because your dietitian is also going to tell you how frequently you need to eat. And this varies across programs. Some programs say eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner and a snack, a protein snack in between. Some programs will say breakfast, lunch, dinner, no snacks. Some will say eat every three to four hours, 
you do what your pro your dietitian tells you to do at your bariatric center. Again, I'm not a registered dietitian, and so I can't give you specifics, but I can tell you that planning for success is much more likely to bring you success. And you can do this in whatever way works for you. You can have prepackaged protein, high protein meals. There are a lot of frozen meals that have only protein and vegetables and no carbs. So that may be a great option for you if you want to pop something in the microwave. Again, you can make something ahead of time and take a portion, a healthy portion of that food with you. Whatever works for you. But remember, have a plan so that you're not left going, oh, I have no choice. I must go through the drive-thru. No, that is a setup and self-sabotage. So make sure you have healthy sources of protein, healthy vegetables, and healthy fruits available to you at all times. All right, the next got to do them is eat on a regular basis. And I just covered that information basically that you, you know, you can't expect a vehicle to run on an empty tank of gas. You can't expect a house to stay warm without keeping the thermostat set and having that heat kicked on or keep that house cool without keeping that thermostat set so the air conditioner comes on. Similarly, we can't expect our bodies to run on empty either. We have to fuel them regularly. And so talk to your bariatric dietitian and find out what your program recommends for how often you should eat. And what do we always eat first? You know it. It is protein. The next got to do them for weight loss and weight maintenance. So this is for the rest of your life we're talking about, my friends. This is for the rest of your life. You need to drink plenty of water. And again, check with your bariatric dietitian to find out how much water is enough water for your body. People are built differently. There are different kinds of guidelines, but make that happen. You might need to get a water bottle with different kinds of measurements on it so you know how often you need to fill it up and drink it down. Throughout the day, you might need to set timers on your phones to remind you how often to eat and how often to take a sip of water, especially the earlier you are to your surgery. Hopefully you're doing these things and developing these really good habits so that in time you're going to be eating these foods and drinking this water on a regularly scheduled habitual basis. So make sure you get the amount of water that your bariatric dietitian recommends that you have. The next got to do them is take bariatric specific vitamins. Oh, there's a lot of controversy about this, but let me tell you, friends, in the decades that I have worked in the bariatric field of medicine, every professional conference that I attend says you've got to take bariatric-specific vitamins because the way they develop these vitamins is by taking lab blood samples from patients and finding out what the deficiencies are given the different surgeries. So you may have had a sleeve, you may have had a SATI, you may have had a bypass, you may have had a DS. There are different vitamin protocols for the different surgeries. So make sure you check with a bariatric specific vitamin company to make sure you're getting the vitamins that are right for you because you want to have the correct dosage of these different vitamins. I cannot tell you how critical this is. You might think, yeah, whatever, I'll take the Flintstones. And there are physicians out there who might say, yeah, take a couple of Flintstones, you'll be fine. It's not true. It is absolutely not true. If you've ever carried a child, then you know the importance of prenatal vitamins. They are developed for a woman's changing needs during pregnancies. The same is true for children's vitamins, for women's multivitamins, for men's vitamins. People are different and bariatric medicine is a specialized field of medicine and there are specific vitamin needs for bariatric patients. Do not take this lightly. 
because people who do take this lightly end up with all kinds of physical problems later on down the road that could have probably been prevented had they taken a bariatric specific vitamins had their labs checked that's another thing so make sure you have your labs checked so you can find out what bariatric vitamins you may need to add to your regimen and again you may have to set a timer on your phone to remind you to take these vitamins people tell me why not you know i'm not very good at taking pills on i'm tired whatever well let me remind you bariatric surgery is a choice that you have made and that means you accept the responsibilities that go along with having made that choice let's say you've got a teenager and that teenager wants to get a driver's license that teenager has to know what the driving laws are the teenager has to know what the different roadsides mean because when that teenager gets a driver's license they are licensed they are accepting the fact that they follow the guidelines and the laws for driving safely think about it in that way and you might have a better realization that you know what I made the choice to have the surgery to help improve my health to be able to do the things that I want to do in my life to prevent future illnesses or to reduce other comorbidities that I might currently have related to my disease of obesity so you're choosing to have this surgery to improve your life in these different ways you are also choosing to follow the guidelines presented to you prior to having surgery if you don't follow the speed limit you might get a ticket if you don't have a license sticker you may get a ticket now nobody's going to give you a ticket in the bariatric world because there are no bariatric police hopefully but if you want to stay healthy if you want to live your best life if you want to keep that weight off then these are the responsibilities you signed up for when you chose to have weight loss surgery the next gotta do them is to exercise regularly people often say they hate exercise well you know you might hate brushing your teeth too you might hate paying your taxes you might hate getting up and going to work you might hate you know having to cart your kids around to different activities you do it anyway so exercise is something that you've got to make peace with you've got to accept that this has got to be done if I say I'm gonna get what I want and I'm gonna get what I want which is lower body weight healthier body fewer medications fewer comorbidities prevention of future comorbidities and a and an ability to do the things that I want to do in my life so there you go you've got to exercise and you can find whatever kind of exercise you want it can range from walking which is a very sufficient exercise to help you lose weight and stay in shape you can choose water sports like swimming or paddle boarding or you know paddle what do they call it yoga on a on a board uh, water skiing if you're that brave you can choose bicycling you can choose weightlifting you can choose boot camps you can choose whatever you want to do but choose something you can mix it up if you've not exercised for years and years and years there are all kinds of free videos online that you can do sitting in a chair there's really no excuse not to because as they say there's a video for that there's an app for that use resistance bands do something we want to maintain our muscles and lose as much fat as we can and be as healthy as we can so hate to tell you but exercise is a gotta do them now this is a benefit to a lot of people not everybody necessarily gotta do this but for a lot of people this is a huge help and that's logging your food logging your food logging your exercise logging your water intake logging your feelings 
while you're eating, those sorts of things, because they provide you, this provides you with a tremendous amount of information. I'm finding myself eating between times I'm supposed to eat. And I've noticed that when I do this, I'm not eating the healthiest foods and I'm feeling stressed. So we're putting a lot of pieces together there. I'm eating when I'm stressed and I'm eating unhealthy foods when I'm stressed. This is going to eventually lead to regain. But if I'm logging all of this, I've got a great deal of information and then I can take it to somebody and say, this is what's going on and I need help with emotional eating or I need help with stress eating. I need some healthy coping skills. Or if your weight's going up, you can look at your food log and say, what's going on? Is my calorie intake too high? Am I eating too many simple carbs? Am I taking in too much sugar? What's going on? What can I tweak and adjust so that the, the scale stays stable or I lose additional weight if that's what you need to do? Sleep. I got to do them for sure. In the last several years, the research on sleep and the importance of sleep for your mind, your body, your spirit, your energy, your weight is mind boggling. There's a lot of talk about sleep hygiene. If you don't know that term, look it up. Sleep and getting enough sleep. It's not just important for teenagers anymore, my friends. It's important for all of us. It is so important that if you read any of the research about it, just Google it and look it up. It's really mind-blowing how essential sleep is for our health and weight maintenance. It's got to do them. Now, the next topic, the next got to do them is kind of a controversial one. And it's about weighing yourself, like using the physical scale. Just like meal planning, you know, there are different ways that you can work this for yourself, knowing who you are, given your personality, given, a, given what's worked for you before and what's not worked for you before. Some people like to weigh themselves every day just to have an eye on what's that scale doing and which direction am I headed. If that works for you and if you don't react emotionally to the number on that scale. And if you understand that day to day there will be fluctuations in your weight, regardless of what you're doing, just by virtue of being a human being who's living, then weigh yourself every day if that helps you. Other people opt to weigh maybe once a week. This gives them information about the direction that their weight is going or the stability of their weight. And if it's giving you information that your weight is going up and you, you, you know, are not in a place where that is okay for your health or your mind, then it gives you information and you can say, what do I need to tweak? You can look at your logs and say, what's going on here? My weight has increased as I know by weighing myself and I can look at my log and go, gosh, I guess maybe I have been giving in to more simple carbs than I thought. So I'm going to cut that back. So those got to do them used together can provide really good results. Some people don't like to weigh at all. Now, you can go by how your clothes are fitting. You can go um, by going to the doctor and saying, I don't want to know what the number is, but could you tell me, you know, if I'm staying stable or what, what's going on? Do what works for you. But be very careful if stepping on a scale and seeing a number affects your self-esteem, affects how you feel about yourself, affects how you treat other people, then you might want to consider getting some therapy or some coaching about that. Because for a lot of people who have weight loss surgery, the scale and the number has been a source of deep discontent, to say the least, for many years, if not their whole life. So if the scale causes you some emotional heartache, get some help to deal with that. Because what we want the scale to be is a piece of information that can help inform you what you need to do to change your behavior. And the last physical got to do them is to create healthy environments for yourself. <laughs> Let me tell you, friends, 
this is an essential critical thing. That might be uh, redundant, but it is. It's essential. It's critical because you've got to keep yourself in a safe environment. What do I mean by that? If you're sitting in a desk like I am right now, and in my drawers, I've got all kinds of trigger foods for me, that's not a safe environment. I'm setting myself up for failure if I do that. I want my immediate environment to have only the healthy snacks I need to keep me going, and I'm only going to eat them at the appropriate times. If I'm unable to do that and I find myself digging into my almonds or digging into my, you know, my protein, whatever, and it's not time to eat, then I need to not keep those things at my desk at all. They need to stay in the break room at work or they need to stay in the kitchen at home. If you have foods in your home that are trigger foods for you, you're setting yourself up for failure. And I know you may have other people in your house. So you're going to have to come to some sort of compromise that's a win-win for everybody. But you've got to have your environment be a safe one. Your car needs to be a safe environment, meaning maybe you set up some boundaries for yourself that say, no food in my car, which then says, obviously, I can't go through a drive-thru because I don't allow food in my car. No exceptions. Sorry, kids. Because you've got to keep yourself safe. It's just like having young children. We do things with young children to keep them safe. We have seatbelts in the car. We have car seats in the car. We keep railings up when they're toddlers so they can't fall up or down the stairs. We keep fences around swimming pools so toddlers can't find their way into the swimming pool by accident. We do things to protect the people we love. Hopefully, that will include yourself. So you've got to create a healthy environment for yourself. So these are the behavioral got to do and it can sound like a full-time job. And initially, it is. Initially, having weight loss surgery and following through with the things you've got to do can feel like a full-time job. That's okay because you're worth the effort it takes, and your health is absolutely dependent upon your taking the time and effort to establish these got to do until they become a habit. So this behavioral got to do list can be downloaded in a checklist form from my website, www.conniestapletonphd.com. So you can check these things off. Now, do I expect anybody to do these things perfectly? Heavens no, but if you look at it, if you tape a copy of this up on your desk or take a picture of it on your phone and review it every morning, noon, and night, you're going to get more and more focused on this. It's going to be more present of mind, and it'll move you in the direction of following through with these behaviors. And if that weren't enough, there's a second list of got to do Now, the second list of got to do is an emotional thing. And hear me when I say this is not something you've got to do every day. But these are some things that you want to work toward over time. And if you pick maybe one of these things a day or maybe one for the entire week and do it a couple of times that week, you're moving in a positive direction. We want to move in a positive direction We work for progress, never perfection. Perfectionism is not a thing we want to shoot for, my friends. Perfectionism is a sign of not good mental health in that regard. We want to work on progress. We want to give ourselves credit for what we do when we do healthy things. That goes for both lists of got to do So when you finish your day and you review your physical got to do them list, if you've done more of these than not, then you have a party for yourself that's not celebrated with food, but that is celebrated with a lot of positive self-talk and affirmation. All right, let's go on to this emotional and psychological got to do them list. Because here's a problem that I have found when I work with patients, that if they don't have skills in 
these areas that we're going to go over in just a minute, then sometimes that translates into not being able to follow through with the behavioral gotta do I want you to think back on past weight loss times and if you've regained, what happened? Most people tell me they went back to their old habits. They went back to their old habits. They went back to their old habits. Well, the gotta do list, the physical one, is a list of behaviors that are necessary to get weight off and keep it off. So by using it, you can stay on track. But let's say, for example, one of the emotional gotta do is setting boundaries for yourself and with other people, but you don't have the skills. You're uncomfortable saying, no, grandma, I'm not going to eat your famous unhealthy food because you don't want to hurt grandma's feelings. Or maybe you don't have the skills to set boundaries for yourself. I will keep my home a safe environment, or I will tell my family I would appreciate you keeping such as such a food away from me. It's a trigger for me. If you want to have it in the house, please keep it in your bedroom. Maybe it's hard for you to set boundaries. So if it's difficult for you to set boundaries, which is one of the emotional and psychological got to do it's going to be difficult for you to stick with the behavioral got to do which is likely going to result in regain. So this list of emotional and psychological got to do as I read through this, you know, kind of assess yourself and go, am I good at that? Am I pretty good at that? Am I okay, but could learn more? Or do I really, really suck at that and desperately need to learn to do that so that I can follow through with my healthy lifestyle? So maybe just look at this list every day and go, how am I doing with this? Maybe I need to work on this. And how do I work on these psychological got to do Well, just like with the, the behavioral ones, sometimes you have to go see your bariatric dietitian. Sometimes you need to get a personal trainer. Sometimes you need to see a therapist. Sometimes you may need a bariatric coach. Do what you got to do. But I'll tell you, a lot of these emotional and psychological got to do you can learn about by doing a good gur- gurgle, a good Google search and reading some information. Take responsibility for doing these things. Again, just look this over, kind of maybe pick a topic a month, topic a week, and say, I'm going to learn about boundaries this week. I'm going to learn about motivation this week. I'm going to learn about commitment this week, whatever it happens to be. But let's go ahead and read through this list of emotional and psychological got to do that will help you stick to the behavioral changes you need to make. Devoting time to engaging in mindful eating practices. Well, what does that mean? Well, most people, and prior to bariatric surgery, you may be guilty of this, eating while you're driving, eating while you're watching TV, eating while you're scrolling on social media, eating while you're, you know, reading a book. That's not mindful eating. Mindful eating is eating while you're eating, paying attention to what you're eating, how quickly you're eating, how much you're eating paying attention to the taste of the food, the sensation of the food, and really engaging in the mindful eating. So when you're eating, you're only eating. Mindful eating. This includes sitting yourself at the table to eat, setting your utensils down between bites, not having distractions. This is something really important to do because mindless eating results in excessive calorie intake eating more than you thought you would. And that is going to lead to regain. So one of the emotional psychological got to do is learn to sit still and eat while you're eating and do nothing else. The second one is learn and practice healthy coping skills. Why? Why do I, what, what do I even mean by healthy coping skills? The number one reason people tell me they regain weight is because of stress. Or they'll say life happened. And I regained weight. Or, you know, they'll give me examples. My parents were ill or my, you know, child was in the hospital or I moved locations or my job got busy. These are all examples of life stressors. And let me tell you, friends, life is not going to quit being life because you've had weight loss surgery. You will have stress almost every single day of your life. That's the nature of life. 
And if you eat in response to stress, then you need to find some different coping skills because your eating is a source of coping. It's how I deal with stress. When I'm stressed, I eat. When I'm angry, I eat. When I'm sad, I eat. When I'm lonely, I eat. Now, there are people who absolutely don't eat when they're upset or worried or bored. But a lot of people, when you're bored, you mindlessly eat. That's what we talked about in the first one. When you eat, you eat at the specified times and you do nothing but eat. Coping skills are how do I deal with stress without harming myself? We want healthy coping skills. I don't want to eat. I don't want to drink alcohol. I don't want to smoke weed. I want to live life on life's terms. And I want to be able to deal with these things in healthy ways. So if you're an emotional eater, then I would do a Google search on how to stop emotional eating, how to curtail emotional eating, emotional eating no more. There are all sorts of articles that you can read about ways to help you disengage from emotional eating. You can also look up healthy coping skills and you will get lists and lists and lists and lists of things you can do that are instead of eating and that are not going to harm you in some other way. And I would take that smartphone of yours and I would find a note section and I would make a list. Here are some healthy coping skills so that when you get stressed and you're like, oh, I can't think of anything but eating, you can look at that list and it will give you some options to follow through on. So one of the emotional got to do them and a critical one is to learn and utilize healthy coping skills. This will really help you prevent weight regain. And I understand that a lot of you may not have learned anywhere about how to deal with stress in healthy ways. So you're going to have to learn or you're going to have to find somebody to teach you, which could be a therapist or a coach or somebody in the mental health field. All right. Increase, here's a, here's a big word one. Increase your self-efficacy and autonomy. In other words, you need to learn some skills that are going to increase your belief in your ability. And you're going to have to make up your mind that you're going to do these things on your own. This is a tall order. This is not easy. So self-efficacy means I believe I can do this. I believe that I have what it takes to do this. My friends, so many people come into weight loss surgery having, quote, failure after failure after failure in terms of keeping weight off after losing it in the past. Do not take that to mean that you are a failure. Not succeeding with some goals does not make a person a failure. A failure is not reaching a goal, not a human being. A failure is an event, not a person. So you may have failed at keeping your weight off. So we need to learn ways to keep that weight off and develop self-efficacy. Because if you haven't been able to, it's not likely you've got a lot of belief in your ability to do so. So you're going to have to get some therapy or you're going to have to read about improving self-efficacy, improving self-confidence, which is often going to include changing the way you think. You may not even know you have negative self-talk and you're engaging in a whole bunch of negative self-talk, which is another one we'll talk about in just a little bit. But you have to increase your ability in your belief in yourself. I think I can do this. I have the skills to do this. And I know you do have the skills to do this. And you know why I know that? Because you've been successful in many areas of your life. If you're successful in one area of your life, you can take those same tools and implement them in other areas of your life. So you've got the capacity. You just have to start believing that. Autonomy means even if nobody does it with me, I'm going to do it by myself. Even if my family says I'm not exercising just because you decide to, do it yourself. Even if your exercise buddy bails on you at the last moment, you do it yourself. Even if everybody in the break room is eating junk food, you stick with your healthy food plan. Autonomy. I will do this because this is for me and this is what I want. All right. Next emotional got to do them. Maintain internal motivation and commitment. 
This is another thing that a lot of people have struggled with in the past. When you've started a new diet in the past, you're all gung-ho, boy, you're motivated. Woohoo, let's go. And you're motivated as long as you see that scale drop. And the number on that scale go down. But as soon as that quits, you lose your motivation. And that's going to happen even with weight loss surgery. Even though there's a high that comes with losing that weight quickly, and it should be exciting for you. And I'm glad about that. But friends, the weight loss is going to slow down at some point, and at some point it's going to stop, and there may be a little bit of regain that goes with that. That is not time to lose your motivation. So motivation has to be something that comes from within. And if you don't have the motivation to stick with stuff, especially when stuff gets difficult, how are you going to continue on with the healthy behaviors? So your motivation is your why. Why did I want to do this in the first place? And why do I want to keep doing the hard work that it takes to keep the weight off? And yes, you heard me correctly. The hard work it takes to keep the weight off, even with GLPs, even with weight loss surgery, even with whatever diet you go on, the maintenance is hard work. We're assuming you've had weight loss surgery for the purposes of this video but maintaining that weight loss, even though it may come off easier than it's ever done before, and thank God for that, it's a lot of work. And if you don't keep your why front and center, and if you don't review that why, why am I doing this? Oh, yeah, I want to prevent the health problems. Oh, yeah, I want to live longer. Oh, yeah, I want to hang out with my kids, whatever it happens to be. The why is the motivation. So if your motivation dies when you don't see that scale going on, going down, you need to read about how to maintain motivation. You may go to therapy to find out how do I maintain my motivation. You may need to see a bariatric coach to dig into that. And commitment is the follow through. So you're motivated. Woohoo, I got all the can't wait to get started. But the commitment, the dedication comes with sticking to it when the going gets tough. You've got to be able to do these things, friends. And these may have been things that have been lacking for you in the past. And that's why I, I call them got to do ums. If you don't know how to boost your own mo motivation, you need to read online how to increase self-motivation. If you don't know how to stay committed when the going gets tough, read about it online. Go to therapy. Do what you got to do. All right. Another got to do them is use relapse prevention and relapse recovery tools. There's a whole science of relapse recovery or relapse prevention, sorry. Relapse prevention means not going back to the old ways, not going back to the old ways. And most people go back to the old ways because of triggers. And there can be biological triggers, like you smell all that stuff in the air, or there can be physical triggers you find yourself in the middle of a food court somehow I don't know how you got there but you know that's a physical trigger it's a biological trigger you see a billboard or you hear a jingle it's a biological trigger you're hearing something or you know a physiological you smell it you see it those are triggers or there can be psychological or emotional triggers you hear the sound of somebody's voice that reminds you of somebody who hurt you and you would use food for comfort. So there are a lot of signals going on, a lot of triggers going on around us in life. And so you've got to have some tools, i.e. healthy coping skills, for when you're triggered and you want to eat. So again, we're back to those healthy coping skills. What do I do when I'm triggered? Well, when you're triggered, you're stressed. So what are some healthy coping skills to deal with that? We talked about that just a little bit earlier. A lot of people have never been taught this. They haven't been schooled in this. So you've got to educate yourself in whatever way you need to do that. The next emotional, psychological got to do them is positive self-talk. And let me tell you, this is one of the things that I think gets people in the most trouble and leads to relapse, leads to the return of unhealthy eating habits because the narrative oh my God, why do I bother? What's the use? What difference does it make? I'll never be able to get this right. I'm such a loser. I'm such a failure. Oh, that kind of stuff is going to do you in. That negative self-talk will do you in and lead you right back 
to the old unhealthy habits. This is a skill that you have got to learn and practice. The skill being changing those negative thoughts out for positive ones. And again, there's a whole science on this. But if you don't change the way you think about yourself, people who think poorly of themselves, who feel badly about themselves, who don't believe in themselves, are going to act accordingly. If I don't feel good about myself, I'm not going to treat myself well. If I don't believe I can do something, I'm going to act in a way that is going to support my notion that I can't do it. Whereas if I think I can do this, then my actions are going to reflect that. If I think I am too important to ruin my health, I have just gotten my health back by losing this weight with the help of bariatric surgery. And I am too important to put that weight back on. So I will eat healthy. I will eat protein first. I will eat every how often I've been told to eat. I will take those bariatric specific vitamins because I'm important. And if I believe I'm important, my behaviors are going to reflect that belief. So if you have negative self-esteem, if you have negative self-talk, if you have negative self-worth, friends, you've got to do something about it. And reading about it is not likely going to fix this. This is most likely going to require some therapy. So I would get in there and get it going on. Start learning to believe in yourself because how you talk to and about yourself is going to match how you treat yourself. All right, next, got to do them for emotions and uh, psychology, your psychological self, is addressing unresolved shame-based issues. What the heck does that mean? Well, it means if you've been bullied, if you've been teased about your weight or any other things mercilessly, relentlessly for, you know, years at a time, if you have been abused, if you have been neglected, if you have been isolated or called names, and you haven't worked through those things, what you have done is internalized them all. Well, if people called me fat and lazy and stupid never amount to anything, I guess that must be true. So if you've internalized that and now you're playing that script over and over and over in your head, what's your behavior going to be like? Well, we just talked about people who believe bad things about themselves treat themselves badly. So if you're struggling from any kind of unresolved, you know, and this, this is nothing you did to yourself. But a lot of times kids are bullied about their weight. Maybe your family continually picked on you about your weight. Maybe, I mean, who knows what it may be. And it may not have anything to do with your weight. You may have been abused as a child, sexually, physically, emotionally, compared to other people. All of those things leave wounds within a person. And if you haven't talked through them and worked through them with a therapist primarily, not just because time has passed, the passing of time will lessen the pain, but it doesn't heal it. There are ways therapists can help you heal from trauma, from pain, from abuse. Because as long as you stay either a victim or you stay a martyr or you stay helpless or you believe you can't change, then you won't. These are big things that a lot of people don't even think about when it comes to interfering with their long-term success when it comes to weight loss. But let me tell you, these things do interfere just as much as the hormone imbalances, just as much as the PCOS, just as much as the insulin resistance. These things will get in your way of maintaining a healthy weight once you've lost it. So if you're struggling with any of the things I'm mentioning, please get yourself some help. Just a few more. An important got to do them, emotional and psychological, is developing boundaries and healthy communication skills. Because if I can't say no, and if I don't have the skills to say no in an assertive, kind, gentle, but firm way, I'm going to be up a creek. Because I can't tell you no, which means if you offer me something unhealthy for me, I'll probably take it because I don't want to hurt your feelings. That's going to cause me to wait, regain weight. That's not what I'm in this for. So I have to learn the skills to communicate with you that no means no. No, I'm not going to have the unhealthy food. No, I am not going to harm myself so I don't hurt your feelings. 
no, I am not going to go with you to the buffet because it's not a safe environment for me. No, I am not going to engage in, you know, a food fest after the support group meeting. I'm not doing that. I value myself more. So learning to set boundaries with other people, learning to set boundaries with yourself. I don't always need to have what I want. Yes, I want this. Do you give in to your kids who want to stay up late every school night because they want to play video games? I hope not. Do you give in to kids who have a tantrum every time they want a $2 toy in the store? I hope not. But do you give yourself permission to give in to your own little tantrum because you want something sweet after work? We have to set boundaries with ourselves. We have to set boundaries with other people. And we have to have the communication skills to do so. If you lack those things, my friends, sign up for some kind of class to learn them. Two more emotional, psychological got to do -ems. You've got to develop a healthy support system. You've probably heard that you're, you're going to end up like the people around you. So if the five people around you have had weight loss surgery and have regained all their weight, you probably will too. If five people around you have had weight loss surgery and they're doing a great job and following through with the God of Dooms, you probably will too. If the five people that you hang around with the most have suffered financial despair, chances are higher that you will as well because we are a lot alike the people we spend the most time with. So stick with the winners is what they say. Stick with people who are going to be willing to say, you know what? It scares me when I see you going back to your old habits. What can I do to help? They don't pat you on the back and say, it's okay. Nobody's perfect. They're going to love you and pat you on the back and say, I'm here for you, but they're going to be honest with you. That scares me. I don't want to see you end up regaining all that weight. I know you've worked hard to lose it. What can I do to help? So a healthy support system is not going to support you if you're engaging in unhealthy behaviors. So find yourself a healthy support system and utilize them to help you get through the tough times. And then finally, emotional and psychological got to do them is utilize professional services. You know, we go to physicians, we have teachers to educate us. If we're having trouble with the emotional and psychological got to do them, then get a therapist, find a bariatric coach, find a bariatric dietitian, find a personal trainer who understands the nuances of bariatric surgery. Get the help that you need. You need to have a healthy, positive, supportive peer group, and you also need the help of some professionals. I went to a conference recently and they were saying that there are thousands of posts every day about bariatric surgery on social media and the vast majority of the information is incorrect. So make sure you're getting your information from the people who have studied and are professionals in this field. You can get advice and input from your peers and that is great and wonderful and you should. But don't take medical advice from your peers. Don't take psychological advice from your peers. Don't take dietitian advice from your peers. Get it from the professional dietitians. Get it from your surgeon. Get it from a licensed therapist. Get it from people who have specific education information in the bariatric field. So that's all I have for that. Gotta do them. It's a lot. It's up to you. But you've got to have the tools in order to succeed. These are the bariatric basics, my friends. I would come back and listen to this. Download your list of both the behavioral and the emotional psychological got to do -ems so that you can review these things and stay tuned in and get the help that you need. All right. Hope that this was helpful for you. Again, replay it. Listen to it as often as you need to. Share it with your friends. This is critical information. You're in this for the long haul. So I will see you next time. I appreciate you spending your time with me. And I would love to hear from you about how this information has impacted you. All right. Thanks for being with me. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.